In this video, I want to go through an example as to how we can generate the posterior predictive distribution, and we're going to continue talking about our example of predicting the disease prevalence within a population. So the idea here is that we have some sort of population, and what we've done originally is we've taken a sample from that population, and within that sample there are a given number of individuals, x, out of a possible number of n, who actually have the disease. And that has allowed us to make some sort of prediction as to the likely values of theta, the proportion of individuals in the population which actually have the disease. Now what we're interested in is we have taken a second sample from that population, call it n primed, and what we'd like to do is we'd like to predict the sort of likely numbers of individuals in that new sample, call it x primed, who actually have the disease. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to work out the probability density of x primed given that we have observed x individuals in our first sample. And we know from before that this is just equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of the joint probability of x primed and theta, which we know we can rewrite in terms of the probability of x primed given theta. And there's no conditioning on x here because once we condition on theta, x and x primed are independent on one another. So it's the likelihood times the probability of theta given x, which is just from before, we recognize this second part here of our expression to be our original posterior density, which we sort of derived before. And this is just simply a likelihood function. And the idea here is that we're gonna start with a prior, I call it a beta prior, to represent our prior knowledge uh, before we do take either of these samples from the population and that's characterized by parameters a and b. We know when we have a beta prior and we have a binomial likelihood, the posterior here happens to be also beta because the beta is conjugate to the binomial distribution. It's a beta distribution with new parameters x plus a and n plus b minus x. So that's our new sort of posterior density and the likelihood remains a binomial likelihood. So what we could do is we could go through and we could actually do this integral by hand, but we don't need to because we've already done an integral which is exactly the same as this previously. We did it to work out the prior predictive distribution. So we know that this distribution, when I integrate it, actually turns out to be a beta binomial distribution. And the beta binomial distribution is characterized by three things. One of them is the sample size of the new sample, which I'm going to call n primed and it's characterized by the a's of the beta distribution, or sorry, the a and the b of the beta distribution which is being integrated over. And that's given here by a primed and b primed, which are these two new sort of parameters of our posterior beta distribution. So the, the sort of second argument, the a of the beta binomial distribution is just simply x plus a, and the third argument for sort of b is m plus b minus x. So this is our posterior predictive distribution in the case of our new sample x primed of a sample size of n primed. So now I want to go through using a MATLAB script exactly how the prior and the sort of likelihood together with the posterior lead to this posterior predictive distribution in this particular case. So if we start off with a uniform prior then the idea here is that we've got a sort of uniform prior over theta, so it's completely flat over choice of theta. Then we have a likelihood which looks something like this, and I should say that I picked here, for the case of our first sample, we found that a sample, out of a sample size of 10, one of those individuals has the disease. So you can see that the likelihood is peaked at the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameter value, which is just 0.1. And then if we sort of multiply the prior and the likelihood together, we then get the posterior density, which just exactly mirrors in this example the uh, likelihood because of the fact that the prior is, uh, prior is flat. Then we see that the posterior predictive distribution, which actually has a different x-axis to the other three, this is now, I've picked a sample size of 10 for the new sample. We see that the posterior predictive distribution exactly mirrors that of the posterior distribution. So. In this example, we see that the most likely number of individuals to have the disease in our new sample is also one. And also notice that the posterior predictive distribution is discrete because here now we're talking about the integer number of individuals in our new sample who have the disease. 
If I change the prior here to now weight towards there being a high probability of an individual having the disease before we actually take either of these samples, we're going to see that the prior now shifts up such that it is now skewed towards the right and the likelihood remains the same and hence the posterior which is the sort of mixture of these two things is sort of partly between the likelihood and the prior. I should say it's probably more weighted towards the likelihood here just because we've got a reasonably large sample size or reasonably a size of 10 and we still see that the posterior predictive distribution here exactly mirrors that of the posterior distribution. As we increase the sample size in our original sample and keep the same number of individuals having the disease or the same proportion rather I should say of individuals having the disease we're going to see now that the posterior is now much closer to the likelihood because of the fact that the prior is now paying sort of or getting less weight in our posterior density and the posterior predictive distribution still is kind of exactly mirroring that which we see in our posterior distribution. Then finally if I increase my sample size in my new sample to 100 so we're now predicting the number of people out of 100, we will now expect to see that this is going to mirror it a lot more closely because of the fact that you know we're not dealing with integers which are so sort of wide apart at the point at which the posterior distribution is actually changing that much. So I hope that that's given you some insight into how the posterior predictive distribution works. I now want to go through and actually derive what the posterior predictive probability is for the case of when we're just picking one new individual out from the population. So what we're doing now is we're saying what is the probability that this one person which we pick out from the population, this new person, actually has the disease given that we've observed the sort of number x from our first sample that actually have the disease. In this example we know that because we're just picking one individual out from our population that the likelihood in that example is just theta because you know if they have the disease the likelihood of them having the disease is just theta and hence the integral just becomes the integral of theta times the probability of theta given x in other words the posterior across theta and this looks exactly like something which we would have seen before it's just equivalent to the expected value of theta given that we've observed the data x because we've just got an integral of the sort of value which we're taking the expectation of times the probability density. And furthermore, because we know that this probability density here is actually a beta distribution, we already know from a beta distribution that the expected value of theta, if I write it up here, the expected value of theta given x, if we're talking about a distribution that's got parameters a and b, is equal to a over a plus b. But here, because a and b are, are sort of new values, a primed and b primed, if you see here x plus a and m plus b minus x, we have to use those values in our expectation. So what we have now is we have our sort of new a, which is just x plus a, divided through by a primed plus b primed, which is just a plus b plus n. And in the example where we have a flat prior, so we have a equal to b, which is equal to 1, we then see that this actually becomes x plus 1 over n plus 2. And now it's very easy to see exactly how the data influences our sort of predictive probability, our posterior predictive probability rather. As x, the number of individuals in our sample increases who have the disease holding n constant, then you can see that the probability increases. As n increases holding x fixed, then essentially that's a smaller proportion of individuals in our sample having the disease and hence our predictive probability for a new person having being drawn from the population having the disease actually declines. So it makes a lot of intuitive sense. If you go back up to this expression here, you see that the prior parameters a and b can actually influence the predictive probability quite strongly, especially if we have a low sample size. So that's just something to be a little bit careful of. As you increase b here, you can see that essentially you're weighting the distribution more towards actually having a relatively low probability of having the disease because that's what is reflected when you actually choose a high b in your prior beta distribution. And a has the other effect. So as you increase a, then it weights the distribution more towards a high probability of that new person having the disease. But when n increases, you can see that the effect which a and b have actually becomes quite small because these are likely quite small numbers when compared to n.